Okay, my friends, my name is Beto Gudiño. Welcome to another episode of ChristianPodcast.com. Today we're going to be talking about Latinos afraid of Christian nationalists. Who are Christian nationalists anyway? Well, today we have an expert on the topic because he's got a book called Disarming Leviathan, Loving Your Christian Nationalist Neighbor. There we go. Okay, so let's bring Caleb to the stage. Caleb, how you doing? Welcome. I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Okay, well, tell us a little bit of who you are, a little bit of what you do, and maybe your latest book, Disarming Leviathan. Sure. Yeah, I serve as a pastor at a uh, theologically evangelical church in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I met the Lord at this church in 2001. Wow came on the staff in 2006 and uh, stepped into the lead pastor role in 2015. And so I'm born and raised Phoenician, and this is home for me. Uh, I started the book, Disarming Leviathan, Loving Your Christian Nationalist Neighbor, out of a heart for uh, engaging the American Christian Nationalists in my community and the families that are connected to people in my church, uh, in my own uh relational circles. Uh, I've seen as uh, over the last few years, there's been a rise of American Christian nationalism and it's uh, tearing apart relationships. It's breaking up communities. It's dividing churches. And so I wanted to step into that space, not from a historical or political or psychological perspective, but from a, a missiological perspective to think like a missionary engaging American Christian nationalists. Wow, missiological perspective. Well, that's helpful. Thank you. And I love the name Phoenician. I've never heard that before, but that's kind of cool. <laughs> that's Phoenix, Arizona. Okay, yeah, so yeah. let's start with the basics, you know. And after this question, I want to know if there's the equivalent in the Bible. But what is a, who is okay. a Christian nationalist? Yeah, so in America, American Christian nationalism, as I see it, is three things at the same time. Uh, it's a political idea or ideology, specifically that Christians should be in charge of the government to protect and promote their way of being in the world, their way of life. Wow. So that's the political idea. Uh, two, it's a tribal identity. It's a way of referring to a specific type of people who have certain origin stories, taboos, dreams for the future, uh, rites and rituals, uh, heroes, villains, uh, food, music. Uh, practices that identify who's in and who's out. And so like a missionary trying to identify a people group, uh, American Christian nationalist refers to this specific subset of people within the United States. And then third, it's a spiritual idolatry. Wow. It is a form of syncretism, which syncs up or merges together aspects of the Christian tradition with aspects of Americana or the American civil religion as well as forms of empire worship, uh, the veneration or worship of the power of the government, the economic prowess of the United States, et cetera. And all three of those elements, the political ideology, the tribal identity, and the spiritual idolatry are present in the movement, but for each individual person, some of those may be turned up more than others. Now that's in America. Around the world, you see similar movements, but they're marked by syncretism of merging aspects of Christianity with their particular place and time. Uh, and so the, the idea of Christian nationalism is prominent around the world in many different places, but it takes on different forms depending on where you're at. Wow. That's well, thank you for clarifying those three points. And maybe at the end we can circle back to those and just kind of like summarize. Cause those are, those sure. are really helpful. Do you think this, started in America or as you mentioned that this has kind of come from here's some music there is that me sorry about that oh no That's worries me. I was like is that me I, I put music on my show too so I'm like <laughs> could that be my device? I hit the wrong button <laughs> okay uh, no sorry problem 
Um, do you think this movement started here in America? I mean, this particular movement for sure, right? But is this, is because as you said, you can witness um, similar behaviors in even in other countries. Is it, mm. do you think it started here or? or no, is, no, no, no. Okay. Uh, the idea of Christian nationalism uh, has taken many different forms over the last couple hundred years as we see around the world the fall of empires and kingdoms mm. and we see the rise of nation states okay. so think about you know america france were some of the first to not have a king or an emperor mm. uh, and as that movement of nationalism grew the question is okay well who gets to be in charge And so is it a certain ethnicity? So you have ethnic nationalism, like in Ireland right now, one of the big conversations they're having is who gets to be in charge? Uh, is it the British or is it the Irish? And mm. so that's an ethnic nationalism conversation. Uh, religious nationalism, there's Muslim nationalism, uh, there's Hindu nationalism around the world. And so Uh, for much of uh, the world, there's also aspects of a Christian nationalism. Again, it's all trying to ask the question, who gets to be in charge of the government mm. uh, and what kind of people are we? Before Christian nationalism, you had something called Christendom. Mm. So these would be like Christian kingdoms or Christian empires. So the Holy Roman Empire is a great example. Charlemagne, uh, different kings and queens and various monarchs around the world would claim to be a Christian kingdom. Uh, and that, I think most would argue, goes back to uh, around the time of uh, Constantine uh, and the Roman Empire, which not only made Christianity legal, but eventually some of the leaders of Rome made Christianity the official religion, so to speak. And so they would proclaim Christianity over all of their subjects. And so for roughly 1,700 years, the church has been wrestling with this question of what is the relationship between the church and the government? Mm. And should the church try to take over the government or be run by uh, the church? Should the government be run by the church? And Christian nationalism is And uh, a, a relatively new expression of that as we see it played out throughout human history. Wow. Oof. That's epic. Fascinating stuff. <laughs> I love, I love the, even just the history of that, you know, just as humans, how uh, just speaks about, you know, the kingdoms we have created and the empires and the relationship even like the other day I was talking to some friends from my, back in the days from my junior high school on oh, wow. on whatsapp and they were saying let's not talk about politics and let's not talk about religion because i was sharing jesus with them you know mm -hmm. but i said why why wouldn't we talk about the things that matter to us as as humans right and i think in this sense you know that uh just a little bit of the what you just narrated kind of makes an emphasis on how as humans we have such a focus on really religion and power mm -hmm. right and government so There's an interesting correlation right there. And, well, I would love to ask you, do you see any sure. resemblance of Christian nationalism like back in the Bible and maybe specifically like the New Testament? Was sure. there a version of that? I was thinking maybe the Salads, but it, no, do you see any of that? And could you elaborate? Yeah, from my understanding, the Zealot movement that you see in seed form in the Gospels, but really became manifest and more pronounced uh, in later years uh, after the Gospels. Um, it does seem like a version of religious nationalism, although they didn't understand, they didn't have a framework for nation states. They would have thought in terms of kingdoms. So certainly in the disciples, when Jesus is talking about the kingdom coming, When he talks about the kingdom of God is at hand, notice the types of questions that they ask him. They ask him questions that are very earthly, like, mm. uh, can we sit at your right hand and your left? Uh, Peter seems to have a difficulty seeing how the kingdom of God involves Jesus being crucified. And Jesus, uh, Peter says to Jesus, you know, may it not be so. Uh, mm. the disciples seem to want to lord their power over their subjects. Again, very kingdoms of this world style thinking. 
And Jesus is perpetually critiquing or correcting their understanding of the kingdom of God. And so, yeah, I believe that in the disciples, you see on display an ethnocentric religious view of who gets to be in charge. It's going to be mm-hmm. our people who live our way of being in the world, and we're going to rule over everybody else. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in that sense, you see the roots of Christian nationalism throughout the New Testament, uh, even in the book of Revelation, where there is uh, an account of churches that have erred in one direction or the other. But one of the ways that they err is giving their allegiance to the beast, the beastly powers, uh, the dragon, so to speak. Wow. And I understand the revelation being a criticism of the worship of the Roman Empire, Mm -hmm. uh, gaining military and economic power. Uh, by your allegiance to the emperor or by your allegiance to the empire. And I think that the early church was tempted with that. And I think that perpetually the church is tempted with where do we place our allegiance? Is it in an ethnocentric or religiocentric uh, dominating structure, which we're lording over people, or is it uh, to live as ambassadors of the kingdom of God, practicing on earth as it is in heaven, of the way of Jesus whenever we're gathered. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's so good. Substantiated, man. I really appreciate your comments. <laughs> so, um, Leviathan, right? And, yeah. and I mean, you have a flag in the back, and I want to come back to that, but sure. and I'll explain. <laughs> but Leviathan, is that the dragon? Yeah. Like, how is this related at all? Like, <laughs> you know, uh, disarming, disarming Leviathan. Yeah, so in the Bible, there are multiple ways that the biblical authors image or imagine chaos and evil. Uh, In the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 3, there's the humans in the garden, and then out of nowhere, there's a serpent, and the serpent talks to them. Mm. In Genesis chapter 4, Cain is meditating on murdering his brother Abel, and Yahweh says to Cain, Be careful because sin is crouching at your door. It wants to devour you. It's this predatory animal, predatory beast-like language. In the Revelation, which we just mentioned, chaos and evil are imaged as a beast and a dragon. And in the Psalms, uh, Job and some of the prophets, that same imagery uh, is called the Leviathan, this ancient sea serpent that lived in the chaotic, disordered abyss. Uh, So where God shows himself as orderly, uh, creating order out of chaos, the Leviathan is a figure of something that brings not order but disorder, uh, Mm -hmm. not peace and unity but disunity and chaos. And throughout the scriptures, there is an understanding that humans can give themselves over to that power. So wherever you see disorder, chaos, a disintegration, uh, it is the Leviathan at work. And human kings and generals are said to have given themselves over or to leverage that power uh, by sowing division, disunity, disintegration in order to gain economic, uh, military, or political power. Wow. Oof. That's so good. Okay, so you have a flag in the back, right? And it's the United yes. States of America flag. So I have two do, flags. Do, do you have two? I don't see the other one. Well, I have the United States. This oh. is 48 stars. So Arizona is the 48th state. Okay. So it's a 48 star flag. Oh, and wow. And this, it's actually not a flag. It's the uh, Black Watch Tartan, which is the Campbell family's tartan in Scotland. Oh, wow. So I, I have both because I'm an American nice. and my people come from Scotland. Wow. That's cool. Okay, so let's talk about that because sure. uh, when when you encounter people and you talk about these these things, how are you? Maybe even not an America hater, but but <laughs> right. but maybe uh, I don't know what what's the healthy way to love your country. Right? Yes, great question. So nationalism, Christian nationalism in America, is an argument about power powering over others. Mm. Uh, It's about dominance. It's about who gets to be in control. 
patriotism is about love for one's people. So mm. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Four Loves, talks about healthy patriotism as the word that we use to talk about love of my hometown or my home country, love for the music, the language, the people, the way of being in the world. And it's a love and affection in the same way that I love my family probably more than I love your family. Uh, I certainly don't think my family should dominate over your family. Mm. And so patriotism is a healthy love for one's people. It's the love of family expanded out to the tribe or one's people group. But true patriotism, C.S. Lewis says, true patriotism does not have a hostile or negative view against others. Mm. It just simply is a recognition that I'm of this people and I love them different than I love you and your people. But I expect everyone to love their people, which is fine. There's no supremacy there. So a healthy American patriotism is to love my people, to love my place, to love the music, the food, the all the different aspects of what it means to be an American, but not to force or dominate that over others. Mm. And that's the distinction between a nationalistic view and a patriotic view. Wow. Uh, I think the Apostle Paul shows this. Mm-hmm. Paul is ethnically Jewish. He never looks down upon his people. He doesn't disown them. He doesn't give it up. In fact, he continues to practice uh, the rites and rituals of his people. But anytime that got in the way of his ultimate allegiance to Jesus, uh, he set it aside. And he did not want that to get in the way of a union in the communion of saints. And I believe that American Christian nationalism elevates one's people over others in such a way that it creates disunion in the church. Mm. Wow. So where have you, how have you witnessed that specifically, maybe that disunion in the church here in America? Sure. So in the evangelical church, especially of which I am a theological evangelical, I am continuing to see increase in language like if you don't vote a certain way, you can't be a Christian yeah. or a real, all real Christians are going to back this candidate or Christians need to rally together to take this particular political stance and uh, force it on everyone else. And if you don't agree with us, you're not a real Christian or you're not part of the church or you're not faithful to Jesus. And so it's taking a debatable, open-handed issue and making it an absolute that defines who's in and who's out. So there's an awful lot of, if you're not for us with this political agenda, then you're against us and you're an enemy uh, to be confronted or excused from the communion. And so it is kind of like a fundamentalism, which creates uh, real tight borders on the insiders and then a real hostile attitude towards the outsiders. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that's what Jesus wants for his church. He wants us to be unified, to center on him, not our political convictions or our ideas about how we should govern in the kingdoms of this world. That's so good. Okay, so how do we... Let's talk about foreigners, right? Which I am, sure. I am one of them, and it's so interesting because I've been reading the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. I'm reading the Bible in a year, like chronologically. Oh yeah, and it's it's really helpful just to see, you know, how everything has been developed from you know Adam and Eve to where we're at now with you know, <laughs> millions of people and problems with kings and exiles yeah. and stuff like that. But what keeps popping up that I feel like it's so interesting is that within Israel and Judah, there's always a, a sense of like foreigners. They're, they're always going to be foreigners yeah. among you. And there's mm-hmm. a certain way in which you got to treat them. Right. And so anyways, that that's just super interesting that the, the, the Bible has almost like an opinion on that. Right. And very, almost like very oh, specific yeah. opinion on how to treat don't know the foreigner so with that, you know, how do you see foreigners here in America, and especially, you know, you said you're from Phoenix and I'm very familiar, well, not super familiar, but quite familiar with um, 
you know, states that are close to the border. And of course, mm -hmm. we had a situation pretty recent and it's kind of like still going. And it has it has been going on for decades, right, of people crossing over the border from Mexico, yeah. whether they're from Mexico or from other countries. But Mexico is the, the country right next door, right? So people have to go either through Canada or through Mexico to get into the U.S. from other countries. And to say the least, a word we could use for them is foreigner, right? And so how, how do you see that? And how do specifically maybe even the people around you in Phoenix uh, yeah. see that? Like uh, what kind of is there commotion? Is there uh, any type of feelings towards sure. the foreigner? Maybe a, a different type of foreigner? I don't know. Like how, how do you relate to that? <laughs> Yeah, so you're right to notice throughout the scripture, the quartet of the vulnerable, the widow, the poor, the immigrant, and the orphan are referred to over 2,000 times wow. as people to whom we should be paying a special attention and care to. Uh, the word hospitality, uh, philo xenon in Greek, you could also translate it that as love for the foreigner. Wow. So the where we get xenophobia, the, the fear of the outsider, and wow. philo, which is love, love of the foreigner. Uh, so that that's baked into the Christian tradition, this idea of hospitality, welcoming the stranger. Jesus talked about, if you welcome, you welcome me. Uh, so to be a people of welcome is one of the core identities of a Christian. So any sort of hostile attitude towards outsiders would be antithetical to the teachings of an example of Jesus. Uh, I would notice that in Arizona, where I am, historically, there's been a very positive view on uh, those who are coming from the southern border. In fact, there have been seasons in Arizona's history there, where there have been very easy to attain ways of legally uh, transitioning across the border for work. Um, we have a large agricultural uh, industry here, and so seasonal labor is a big deal. And historically, Arizonans have had a great re relationship to northern Mexico. And frankly, as a Phoenician, I have more in common in many ways uh, with people from Baja uh, than I do with people from like Maine. Wow. So, right. Like regionally, yeah. like our food, like the way mm -hmm. we like to be in the world, paint colors. Uh, I, I have more in common with North Mexicans. Uh, especially in the Baja, than I do people on the East Coast of the United States of America. Yeah. And so there has been historically a sense of like, yeah, actually, we're all kind of from the Sonoran era area. Uh, in recent years, the fear or anxiety of bad actors coming across the border has dramatically increased. I think especially this side of 9-11. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and that fear and anxiety has been leveraged by political actors to generate uh, money, votes, power. Because you can make a lot of money by promising to protect people against the bad guys. Mm. Uh, moreover, this anxiety has deadlocked much of the work, uh, A, in ministry, ministering to immigrants, uh, refugees, asylum seekers, et cetera, and uh, any sort of legal framework that could actually help bring solutions where we see a lot of brokenness. I think there's a lot of brokenness, especially just speaking as an American, on the American side of the border with how we do things like asylum, uh, immigration, et cetera. Uh, and it just seems like we're in deadlock because there's so much anxiety and fear. And one of the things I think that the teachings of Jesus can show us is there's a ton of stuff that is scary and yet jesus is bigger than all of that so when he says do not be afraid he means it mm. and when we operate out of fear instead of trust in the lord we end up being hostile towards the foreigner in direct contradiction to the biblical commands and that doesn't mean that we don't practice safety it doesn't mean that we don't expect our government to do everything it can to keep us safe i mean that's every i think that's every government around the world's charge um and yet the threat or the potential threat or the perceived threat of an outsider, Jesus knew what that meant when he gave us these commands. <laughs> uh, 
he was living in a space that was occupied by outsiders. Mm. The, the Romans were occupied. Wow. They were an occupying force in Jesus day. He knew what it meant when he said, love the stranger, that it would be risky. I mean, that's why it's so radical, right? Mm -hmm. I think for many American Christians, they failed to capture just how radical that call to love the foreigner is. Wow. Yes. And I love the word hospitality. Thanks for like breaking it up because you said it's the love of the foreigner. And I, I, I didn't know that, but that's. That's a great way to see it. And so, I mean, I, the, the way I look at things is it's, um, you know, through my Jesus lens, I guess, is we're one yep. humanity and borders have a reason. Countries have a reason. Governments have a purpose, maybe even. Uh, but and I don't know, when you look at somebody else and maybe despise them because of the way they look. To me, that's mm -hmm. where, you know, we it talks about the attitude of the heart and maybe also the. You know, when you talk about power, and especially a nation like the United States, that's I mean, it's a, one of the greatest nations. Some people say the greatest nation on earth, right? Uh, I'll give it to you. I'm here, you know, and I love America. <laughs> so, but it, like, how do you love people, right? And especially as, as a Latino, I guess let's flip the script a little bit, right? So if hospitality is the love for the foreigner, but if the foreigner is afraid of the know the christian nationalist how can how can maybe even without being shown hospitality not i'm not saying this is my case you know i'm like I, yeah uh, no the people around me have been so welcoming in a sense you know even though i have a few encounters here and there but uh regardless how how can i love uh these people better right how can mm -hmm. i maybe even show like like my wife that's why you know uh, before we started recording if she was here she would take this conversation to a complete like relational level <laughs> yeah sure because she she doesn't care you know if our neighbors are whichever right christian nationalists or muslim or other things right but she wins them because she wants she wants to be loved by their neighbors like mm -hmm. she wants to have almost like this hospitality from them and if mm -hmm. she doesn't get it what she does is she makes food for them she cooks and she brings a dish and she has won over many yes. neighbors many neighbors from different yes. backgrounds you know <laughs> so uh, i mean yeah, i guess i'm answering the question yeah. right but um yeah have well, you have you experienced that how, how do we love people yeah there's so much emphasis today on jesus flipping tables when he notices people doing wrong, doing abusive things, doing hateful things, I think the instinct for many is, yeah, flip the tables, right? Drive out the money changers. And that happened once in the Gospels. But notice how many times Jesus set tables. Mm. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus is always at tables with a bunch of people who are nothing like him. Wow. He's got religious leaders, zealots, tax collectors, fishermen, prostitutes, etc. And it's at the table of hospitality that people feel not only welcome, but honored. Uh, and their heart begins to feel safe because bigotry, xenophobia, anxiety, that's all stuff in the heart. Mm. And so if we want to invite people to relationship, even across boundaries whatever those boundaries may be, uh, we first need to recognize that we have an invitation to connect heart to heart with someone before we go head to head with someone. Wow. So if I have a neighbor who thinks differently than I do, and if I think that their thinking is grotesque, disgusting, evil, fine. But I've got to recognize that that thinking is coming from a place of the heart first. And if I want to truly know my neighbor then we're going to connect heart to heart. So uh, what your wife is practicing is what Jesus practiced, which is eat with people at table, set the table of hospitality, and then seek to know them, not their ideas, uh, not the tribes that they're part of, but who they are. And in so doing, we love our neighbor as ourself. And gently and compassionately seeking not only to know them, but to seek to understand why they believe the things they believe. You know, we can say things like, tell me a story about why that matters to you. 
or, Hey, that thing you said yesterday about, you know, something that I disagree with. Uh, tell me more about that. I want to understand what's underneath that desire, what underneath that, uh, that conviction or that value. And almost always, if we dig down deep enough, we can connect on shared values. Mm. And so my neighbor who I might think hates my guts because of who I am or what I've done, that, that may well be true. But if, if I'm in a position, which we aren't always in a position to, but if I'm in a position to safely reach out to them through hospitality, I may find that all the stuff that they're thinking or saying or they're posting on the internet, it's all connected to a deep value that I actually can resonate with, even if I haven't come to the same conclusions or postures that they have. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oof, that's so helpful. I love, you know, setting tables helps us connect heart to heart before we mm -hmm. start connecting mind to mind. Uh, that's really powerful. And you have said a lot of like really powerful statements today. So let's talk about government. <laughs> sure. And I love that idea of, you know, you were saying at the beginning, like the three ideas, right? The, the political idea mm -hmm. that we want Christianity in government, right? Or we want a Christian person to be sure. on the top of the power. And then you were saying that um, this whole thing scrums, comes from believing that we, our origin of our people, right, has, it's rooted in the same. And then syncretism, right, which is almost like a combination of a, a, no, a melting pot of a little bit of Christianity and a little bit of this and a little bit of my you know, passion for my country or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, those are super helpful. And what I love about the idea of government is like, To me, I think the highest value I find, you know, this is going to be maybe just super personal theology, but the highest value I find in Scripture, and especially the New Testament really, but I think throughout, is the idea that, that we can have self-control, right? Mm -hmm. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. And, That's you know, right. you start like with Cain and Abel, like, Cain killing Abel, right? Like lack of self-control. And then God comes and starts like questioning him. And he's like, you know, I got angry and my, it's almost like my anger overtook me. So yeah. I see that throughout scripture, like from the beginning to the end. And, but, but if you pair that with the idea of government, I think we have something powerful because you were saying yeah. almost like we are capable of governing ourselves right and especially through christ if he governs us like he you know we can we can have self-control and fulfill his will in our lives and not our will right but that's that's a sort of submission to the government of christ in our lives and the idea of government like uh i don't know it's always so interesting to me because it's like we are the government like the government is not like that over there entity right. the government is form of people right and people have i mean yep. people is us ultimately right like and especially in a democracy i guess you you get to choose your leaders in that sense so i mean that's that's a really powerful idea like the battle between our own self-control and the government of christ through us yeah. and yeah. the big government right the government that that rules nations and you know, puts borders in place and all of that and and this idea right like the law is the law so i mean those are those are really interesting to me but all that to say you know like how do we would it ever be bad and i don't think so right but like what is a healthy um, desire to have a christian in government right I don't think it's sure. bad if Christians try to run, you know, for California governors or things right. like that, yeah. or mayors or, you know, your local um, school community or things like that. So, but what is a healthy maybe vision of as a Christian, yeah. can I attempt to be in government without like yeah. being swallowed up by Leviathan? Yeah. First, just noticing that government is power. And so whenever we're talking about government, we're talking about the stewardship of power and influence. Wow. And just like money uh, and sex, it's a good thing. But if it becomes the ultimate thing or if we, if we come 
consumed by it, it destroys us. All idols, Tim Keller talks about this, that idolatry is taking a good thing that's been created by God for our benefit and making it the ultimate thing, putting too much stock into it. So yeah, I think government's good. I think Christians should engage in government. Uh, in what posture though, right? So if a Christian steps into government, mm. first of all, what does integrity look like? What does the witness of the gospel look like? Uh, because governments do things that Christians are called not to do. Assassination, espionage, bombs. These are not things that the church is called to do. Mm. Uh, I get real concerned when I hear people talking about Christian government or Christian nations, because whenever those governments operate in the world, they're proclaiming the name of Christ by doing things like bombing people. I mean, one of the most striking things to me was in the uh, two atomic bombs that America dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan. Uh, the Japanese newspapers called them the Christian bombs. Wow. So I want to wow. give a lot of uh, thought to if I'm a Christian operating in government, that does not mean that the government is Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm giving total allegiance to Jesus. And if I'm a mayor or a senator or a governor, I'm a Christian. But that doesn't mean that the government is Christian. And if you added 100 more Christians that's a bunch of Christians operating in government, but to call the government inherently Christian uh, mars the witness of the church. Mm -hmm. uh, governments do things like tax people. They take from people. They send soldiers to war. Uh, these are not things that the church does, nor um, that Christians are universally agreed on what the right response to those things is. Uh, so I, I have a huge concern when we start talking about a nation or a country as being Christian. There's a lot of Christians in the country. That doesn't make the country Christian. Moreover, Christians have hardly ever agreed on how to operate in the world. I mean, look at all the different denominations and how we govern our churches. <laughs> like, <laughs> wow. Right? I mean, yes. right, whether it's a Presbyterian model, a Baptist model, a Congregationalist model, the Anabaptist. I mean, if we had an Anabaptist in charge of the Department of Defense we would never go to war because they're people who are anti-war and that's their Christian conviction. Uh, so the idea that there's one Christian view on how to govern, I would defy anybody and just simply say, look at the church. Is it uniform in its government? Mm. Uh, usually when people talk about wanting Christians to be in charge, they mean a denomination of their religion, uh, Baptist, oh. Presbyterian, Lutheran, whatever it might be. So yeah, I think Christians should be, uh, willing to, if not desirous to serve in government, but not as someone to dominate over or to force their way of being in the world at the expense of others, but rather take on the cruciform posture of the servant. Philippians chapter two, Jesus used his power in service to others. Now, how we do that, oh man, that takes a ton of wisdom, a ton of prayer, uh, a local communion of saints to help bring correction. I mean, if I'm a state senator, I need lots of people who are Christians and non-Christians speaking into my life to gain wisdom and understanding. Uh, and it's really difficult. Um, and the other thing that's really dangerous is assuming that one of the man-made parties is somehow inherently Christian. Wow. It's a human-made <laughs> thing. So it is not divine. Uh, which means that the gospel speaks a critical word to every human institution, uh, including the ones that I favor. Mm -hmm. uh, moreover, in America especially, I would notice that there are Christian Democrats, there are Christian Republicans, there are Christians in the Green Party, there are Christian Libertarians, there are Christians who are independent and have chosen not to align with the party. Uh, the guy who wrote the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag was a Methodist socialist. So wow. there is a diversity of views in the American church on how to govern and what it means to uh, do right by the Lord and do right by a people. Uh, and so any Christian involved in government, I think the first of all, the invitation is abiding in Christ. And second, the invitation is 
carry this with humility, wow. uh, not assuming that you have the quote unquote Christian way of governing or leading. Yeah. Oof. So you said the Pledge of Allegiance, is that what you said? The Pledge of Allegiance was, yeah. uh -huh. was done by a social, uh, what do you say? A, a Methodist, Methodist pastor so who was a socialist, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And, my, and my kids American recite history, that every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> American history is way more complex than we like to give it credit for. Yeah. And same with church history in America. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That. Well, that's for sure. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about the confession of evangelical conviction and yeah. i'll give you i'll give you my my background and my take on this because really what people want to hear here is who can i vote for right, yeah, right. <laughs> as a christian i mean that's what people are asking for and somebody that you forgot to mention as like you said you no know, christian republicans christian democrats i am a christian undocumented for now you know i'm hopefully you know praying waiting that god will provide you know the the papers for me and my family especially yeah. i mean my wife because my kids were born here so mm. i think that's coming you know because we've been praying we've been waiting god has a purpose so I'm, yeah. i'm not afraid of that but i wanted to say you know there's a lot of christians not because it's just me in my example right but i know a lot like a lot of christians who are here undocumented who love yep, jesus who love the church who are you know, good citizens to the best of their ability, you know, who are hard worker. Yep. So I just want to say that. And yeah, so tell us about the confession of evangelical conviction and what's your involvement in that? Yeah, I was one of the initial signers um, and proud to sign it, stand by it. It is an attempt to articulate guiding principles that, that I find and that we, the signers, have found uh, in Scripture to be thinking and processing through as we engage in the body politic. So there are so many voices claiming, you know, this is the Christian way, that's the Christian way. And, and man, you know, like some of them I agree with, some of them I disagree with. Uh, this was an attempt to get down to um, first principles in our posture towards things like character, uh, peace, not violence. Uh, things that, in my understanding, and I know that some people disagree, uh, but in my perspective, uh, things that Christians have advocated for throughout church history and throughout the world. And that by thinking or rethinking and meditating on those core principles, uh, that we can ask the Lord to bring guidance and conviction And then out of that space, step into our engagement with, uh, in this case, in my case, American government. So we're being asked to vote for a federal, state, county, city, school district uh, elections and ballot measures. And uh, too often we get hung up on just the top of the ticket. Uh, I believe that it's wise and loving to steward our time well and our energy well by also paying attention to what happens locally. Uh, perhaps even more so than what happens in uh, D.C. And so, yeah, that statement came out of what I perceived and, and many others perceived to be a gap in the national conversation about what it means to be an evangelical and how that shapes our engagement in the body politic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have here that there's notable signatories, including <laughs> Russell Moore, former uh -huh. head of the Southern Baptist Convention's Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, Reverends Gallin Corey and Walter Kim of the National Association of Evangelicals, yep. Justin Giboney, and progressive Christian author Shane Claire Bourne. Uh -huh. uh, he, he's with the advocacy group Red Letter Christians. Christian rapper, you're going to love this one, Lecrae. You know it. <laughs> Christian rapper Lecrae. And mega church pastor Joel C. Hunter. I mean, some of some of these names I know, right? Like Lecrae. Like yeah. he was just um uh name drop with like some big famous uh rap artist or something like that. And I follow him on YouTube, his channel, and he's got amazing conversations mm -hmm. with people. But do you think some of these people that signed, you know, including yourself, what's some of the maybe backlash you've been receiving and how do you deal with that? Yeah. I, I mean, I haven't gotten much at all. A couple little bits here and there. 
Nice. What I see, uh, kind of at the, the folks who have, you know, large platforms and who are known and, you know, household names in evangelicalism, I think most of the pushback is accusations that this is a bad faith attempt to get people to steer the election mm. uh, towards the blue team. Wow. And I, I think there's an awful lot of that going around. I don't think this is that. Uh, I think it's a call for Christians to get back to first principles. I've also seen a lot of money being made by people who are witch hunting fellow evangelicals uh, to try to argue that they're operating in bad faith, secretly promoting a Marxist atheist agenda because they're getting paid underneath the table. Wow. And when I see how much money there is floating around there, there's a lot of money in the say the conservative thing to promote the conservative candidate to conservatives wow. or ear tickling, as you might yes. say. Yeah. Uh, I am a theologically conservative evangelical pastor in the suburbs of Phoenix. I could tell you there is no financial incentive for me to say th anything that would be critical about the red team. Mm. In fact, there's a lot of money to be made if I did give myself over to that type of posture. Wow. Uh, the idea that there's like, this desire within evangelicals, uh, evangelical pastors, uh, to like woo over atheist Marxists for money, I think is a witch hunt. Mm -hmm. Um, especially since there's so much money to be made in pointing out <laughs> in pursuing the witch hunt. Wow. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that, that, that's uh, one day I want to have Shane Claiborne and Sean, Foch together yeah. and have a and just have them you know i i want to be a couple their of worship mediator. guys <laughs> i yeah. just want to be their just mediator a couple of Christian worship guys yeah and see how yeah. it goes but uh okay thank you for sharing that let's go to our emojis to wrap up the episode okay and i want you to think even as, as we do this of maybe your hope for america right as, okay. as a citizen of the you have the flag there with the 48 48 stars, stars. That's so cool. So anyways, uh, let's think about that. But before we do that, let me put some music. Okay. Where am I? There I am. Okay, we're going to kick it off with the blasphemous emoji. Okay, according okay. to Caleb Campbell, what is the worst idea out there here in America? Oh, the worst. Uh, that the kingdom of God can be propagated by means of the kingdoms of this world. I love it. Next one. Skeptical emoji. Where do you see skepticism or what are you skeptical of? Uh, so many things. <laughs> I am skeptical of the capacity of the evangelical industrial complex in America uh, to produce more good than evil. Wow. That's serious right there. Let's go to inspired <laughs> emoji. Yeah. I look kind of silly, like going back and forth to my. <laughs> recorded over here um inspire emoji where do you see hope what motivates you yeah uh i am reading through biographies of american civil rights activists who are christians whose faith compelled them to uh, pursue good in the community to pursue social justice but not at the expense or the derision of against uh, those that thought the opposite. So peaceful protest, things like that, nonviolent resistance. Uh, it's captivating to me. Wow. Okay, next one is... Holy idea. Holy emoji. Mm -hmm. what's, what's a holy idea according to Caleb Campbell? One of the key 
elements of Jesus' discipleship plan is to put misfits together at tables and ask them to follow him. So good. And last, the divine emoji. What is the highest idea you can think of and maybe like your greatest hope or I don't know, whatever you want to take it. That Jesus in his wisdom wants to change something in me through people who are nothing like me. Wow. That's powerful. Oof. I wonder if more people are willing to do that. Right? <laughs> what, what, like, yeah. What, what yeah. does it take? It's it's it surrendering, humility, all of those. Yep. yep. Oof. For sure. That's powerful. Okay. And this is how we wrap the episode, Caleb. Just point us to great. your resources, where you want to point people to, yep. your website, etc. Sure. Website is disarmingleviathan.com. We're on all the socials. And on our website, disarmingleviathan.com, you can find our podcast, links to other resources, links to the book, Disarming Leviathan, Loving Your Christian Nationalist Neighbor, published by InterVarsity Press. Came out uh, like nine weeks ago. Nice. There you have it. Well, I want to invite you. You know, we're here in Costa Mesa, California. So we're not yeah. that far. We actually have a studio. If you maybe can tell, I don't know, behind my um, my chair. We have a really nice studio that we rent out, you know, and that's where we produce the episodes with my wife, Millie, in Spanish, English. We have people from the community call, uh, come and give their testimonies and stuff like that. So if you're ever down here, you know, I would love for you to come visit and maybe we can even do a, a live session here and record. Oh, I'd love That'd that. would be awesome. So be keep sweet. that in mind when you're in SoCal, Costa Mesa, Orange County. We can go for some tacos and awesome coffee places <laughs> here. <laughs> Love it. Okay, I love Caleb. It. Thank you so much. I'm going to hang yeah. up here, but stay okay. a little bit. I just want to make sure that the video uploaded on your end Great. so I can have the highest quality. And again, everybody that you know tuned in today or listening today, thank you so much. You know you can like, subscribe, share this episode with a friend, follow us on all the platforms. You can find us at christianpodcast.com and um, English and Spanish episodes. We'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye, amigos.